You're okay. Yeah, so I, I wanted to to sort of recap um, some of the basic um, themes we've been exploring um, in, in, that are emphasized in chapter 13 with functors. Um, and then I want to go into a bit of final material uh, for, for that chapter coverage uh, that uh, relates to functors for finding sort of patterns, shapes, uh, and also explores uh, this pseudo category of great significance in computer science called HASC, which is uh, a category or quasi category, sort of uh, a would be category uh, that characterize types and functions um, on the, those types. Um, so, you know, chapter 11. Um, and then chapter 12, we saw um, a set of simple categories. Chapter 12 um, reminded us of, of, of set, um, which is a category where there's, you know, objects are, so this is the category set where objects are individual sets and, and, and uh, morphisms are functions between them. And the important thing to, to remember here is that sets really have no internal structure. They have a set of elements, but those elements aren't, there, there's not these relationships between those elements within a given set. It's not like one element um, within the set by itself is uh, greater than another, divides another. If we want to impose that sort of structure, we get kind of embellished sets, um, things like pre-orders. But a set by itself has no real structure. It's a, it's a bunch of elements, okay, uh, is the idea. Um, at the same time, we saw there were other categories which were like set, but where there was some order. Uh, an example would be a pre-order category where we have subset relationships, right? So there's an arrow for many uh, between two sets A and B if A is a subset of B. Do you remember that? It's a pre-order, and uh, just like any pre-order, you either or have zero or one morphisms between any two objects, right? Um, what is the identity morphism on one of these sets here? What 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 would it mean? What's the meaning of the identity morphism? A set is a subset of itself. Yeah, a set is a subset of itself in sort of a, a trivial way, and and we also had. These sort of small drawable categories, um, one of whose presentations is shown here, which you'll recognize now as the schema category. Right? This is a, a category that we can use through a functor into set to, to encode graphs. Remember that? And um, uh, we, we further saw some small categories like um, that were. Well, who recognizes what this is? What is this category? It's an example of a what? Is this a pre-order? Is it a, is it a monoid? It's a monoid. It's a monoid. And the elements of the monoid, where are they in this category? The uh, arrows. The arrows, yeah, the, the morphisms and the elements. This is the identity element. Um, a neutral element, um, the unit, and uh, and this is uh, another element. And here we might be doing plus. You can't you can't see it up here because it's dark thing in the way. But we're doing plus sort of mod mod two, right? Um, so zero added with zero is zero. Zero added with one is one. One added with one is zero, etc. Right? Yeah. Um, so, so those are examples of some small categories. And then in, in this chapter, Eugenia Chang introduces functors. And, and she actually spends less time dwelling on some of the some of the details than I do here. But the idea of functors are are, are one that I really want you to remember is, is it's a structure preserving mapping between categories. And what I want to come back to is 
to, to really emphasize that the structure we are maintaining looks kind of different in each case. But the commonality is that the, the mappings, um, uh, say between one category C and another category D, these mappings that preserve structure from C and D, that honor that structure, that, that um, respect that structure, do so in two ways. Number one, and this is cuts across all the different looks and different feels associated with what how that structure looks, what that structure looks like. The vagaries of that are different among these small categories we've just seen. Um, the ways in which they capture structure, if they capture it at all, the ways in which they capture it kind of look different. But what's common with these functors and how they how they kind of honor that structure is that they map identity morphisms to identity morphisms. So, so an identity morphism in C on an object is mapped into an identity morphism in D on the target of how that object is, is mapped from C to D. So if we have a given object, lowercase c in, in category capital C, um, and it's mapped to F, C over here in D through the action of functor F. Um, there's some object in D, F, C. Um, the identity morphism on C over here is mapped to the identity morphism on F, C, right? Um, so um, you, you kind of see it right here. The mapping of an identity morphism on A with functor F gives identity on F of F um, and map to A, right? The, identity on the object that results from applying the functor to A. But the other thing that has to be honored is the other way in which we encode structure in categories, which is composition of morphisms, right? And so here, if we have two morphisms in the source category, uh, we can either compose them in the source category, that is C, and then map them over into D, and that has to be the same as, it has to be identical, the same morphism as we would get by first mapping F over, and then lowercase f, and then mapping G over, and then composing those, right? Um, and we, we have these kind of fancy diagrams which show that, right? We can either um, uh, compose F and H here and map it over, um, that's so F H after F is this one here. It's some particular morphism from A down to C because we're we're composing something from A to B with something from B to C to get something from A to C, and it, it's this morphism, let's say. And if we map that over, it has to be the same morphism as we would get if we map F over first and H over, and then we were to compose there. We have to get the same morphism. Right. So it's now that may seem arbitrary, but it's it's very nice. It's it's very beautiful that we don't have to worry that it's somehow different. Right. Um, it, it's almost like it. And, and I'm not going to use this word exactly, but it's almost like it commutes more, you know, composition commutes with this functor. We can either hit it with the functor first uh, and compose there or or compose and then hit it with the functor. We get the same, the same results, right? And I noted that sort of mapping morphisms, we call this lifting a morphism from C to D by hitting it with a functor. We sort of, so this process is called lifting mapping from F over to F, okay? So are we okay with that? Do you remember, remember this basic idea? Now, um, uh, I want to emphasize, and you know, you can look at those uh, those details here, though, a few things. So, so again, to give you the sense of, okay, that's kind of a technically, you know, nitty gritty definition, but it means something in terms of structure preservation. I want to go through the structures that we're dealing with and see how this manifests with different particular structures. This notion of honoring structure because it has a very intuitive meaning. So first we'll start with these, this category where we don't really have structure in our objects, right? The objects are just these grab bags of 
of, of elements here in set. You got that? There's no real structure to preserve. And here we get any old function from one set to another um, uh, in this category of, of sets and functions. We have no structure we have to preserve. Uh, it can be any function from one uh, set to another. There's nothing we have to honor about, you know, in order of this set. We can map, say, any of, of these two guys to any of these three. We don't have to we don't have to map it over in a way that's true to a certain relationship between these two. That has to be honored. It has to be preserved. And we have huge flexibility. We have huge freedom. This can be really important because you see certain things come out in set um, with like, uh, when you're dealing with Levere theories and, and you get sort of the free, free monoids, um, uh, there's some some ways in which set is the free has this incredible freedom associated with its maps. By contrast, look at, let's look at some things which do have structure. This didn't have structure to preserve, so it was particularly loose in how we could map these things. So as long as they're functions, we can map them. That's great. There are these huge varieties of maps. Something like this, a monoid. What is the nature of the mapping? If we want to map um, a monoid, does this have structure? <laughs> you bet it has structure. It, it has these rules of what added to what gives what, right? Um, and we can see that here. We could we could see it for the for what's really a, a free monoid where we have uh, natural numbers plus and zero, where we have actually arbitrarily many of these um, of these morphisms, right? Encoding, what do these morphisms here encode? They encode different what? There's yeah, different or natural numbers, zero, one, two, three. There's, um, uh, here we don't uh, have a, a negative there. Um, so here we have, when we have this structure, there's structure, <laughs> there's a lot of structure preserved. There's things that, our identity that that um, you know have to be uh, treated as identity. There's there's ways in which we compose by adding, right, and get other numbers. So one plus one equals two. Two plus one equals three. That's structure, right? There's there's things we have to honor here. These rules, whatever the mapping is, we want to honor these rules. We might coarse grain it, but we want to honor it. You know, we might. We might start to obscure the difference between certain things, but we want to do it in a way that's very consistent. Uh, so uh, here, uh, so, so we might map, for example, this into this category, but in a way that's consistent with like the even numbers get mapped to zero and the odds get mapped to one. Remember that? So what are these things? These are monoid homomorphisms. Those are the mappings between. And, and you could say, well, wait a minute. I thought we said that they were functors. They are functors. Functors for these categories, for monoids, uh, for, for this category of, of monoids, they are monoid homomorphous. You get that point? Like that is what preservation of structure means. That's what the rules of functors mean. They're monoid homomorphous. So these mappings between these things that honor structure. Do you remember um, this uh, before? We went through a little example. We actually talked about some non-examples where it strangles them in some messy way. And those will not be in here because they're not mappings. They're not legitimate honor um, structure preserving mappings. The ones that are in here are the ones that honor the structure. You get that notion? And those are these mono and homomorphisms. So this is more constrained than what we saw with, with set, right? With set, like we didn't have any structure to maintain. So you can map any of these guys on the left to any of these guys on the right. And we didn't have to worry about honoring anything. Here we here we have to honor things. Here we have to be true to it. So we have more constraints, right? To to ensure the structure. Now, another type of thing we, we saw was these pre-orders. 
what is honoring structure when we map from pre-order to pre-order? What does honoring structure mean? It means doing what? It means having what sort of map? If we map from one pre-order to another, what do we get? We get a, okay, well, um, so we map one pre-order to another and there's actually a nice description, an intuitive description of what a functor is there, of what a structure preserving mapping is. It's a very simple concept. It's so simple, you might say, well, where's the functor? Well, it all boils down to those rules that functors have to observe about comp honoring composition and honoring, honoring the identity. And what is, what is a mapping? What's the flavor of a mapping between pre-order categories? So in a word, what is it? It's a certain type of map. It's, it's an order preserving, it's a monotone map. What do I mean by a monotone map? Can anyone say? What does it mean that it's monotone? So if I map, I'll, I'll give you a hint. If I have one thing in the source category, if I have uh, two objects, A and B, where A is less than B, or and here it means it's a subset of, in other cases, it could be a divide, or less than or equal to, but it's in this pre order. A is is kind of less than B, right? Uh, uh, there's a there's a relationship between there's an arrow between them. How do those when those are mapped over? Where how do you think they need to be arranged in the target category? Yes, in the same thing exactly. So you know we have these pre order categories here. We have these monotone maps which map them over. Now that doesn't mean they're the same. This one looks somewhat different than this, but it's different in a consistent way. Do you see? It, it hasn't flipped around so this guy's down at the bottom or or you know this one ends up going below here. And I won't go into it again. I think we alluded to it earlier, but it turns out, although this may seem somehow different than a mono and homomorphism. It's the same rule of functors that are yielding this same pattern, right? That, that compositions have to be mapped over into compositions. Um, and, and this is why like this guy can't go down here because if you can get from A to B here, you have to be able to get from A to B here, right? And if, if we're mapped down to here, it, you couldn't get from the mapping of A to the mapping of B. You have to be able to get there, right? Um, so if this were A and this were mapped here, and if B were mapped beneath it, we'd be we'd be in a pickle, right? Because here we can go from A to B, um, and here we can't. We wouldn't be able to go from A to B because it, you know, it, it, we we couldn't get there um, from that. So. So, uh, you know, I'm waving my hands, but the basic idea is that this monotone property is true to those rules of honoring composition and honoring uh, identity, right? Um, and uh, yes, so, so okay. Kind of okay, um, yeah, so uh, go on, yeah. I think you're talking about preserving in the cycle, we can kind of say there's something that the order that can preserve in the cycle is uh, given the um, given a square between S that uh, goes to the uh, uh -huh. goes to the infected, yeah. goes to the um, cover. That's this is the order that we can preserve in this model. And yeah, so so well, this is a, a good insight, and we'll be talking about that probably not not this time, but in another another case. But you you have a a great insight there, no man, um, that we'll be coming back to because remember that, and I'll get to it in a moment. But things like soft flow diagrams, we can encode categorically. Do you remember this with we, we can encode it with uh, what's called a CSAT, a uh, uh, um, 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 co-preaching. And here, um, there are mappings between 
soft flow diagrams that are homomorphisms that are structure preserving mappings. And uh, they uh, they will take one stock flow model and map it into another in a way that is still true to the basic logic of the original, but it may coarse grain things, it may collapse some things down that were distinct to the right? Um, and uh, you could imagine, uh, you know, this were people who were maybe um, in isolation, so isolated or something like that, totally isolated. And these were people um, who, who died or something like that. There might be a mapping of this whole thing, a homomorphism to one which just that three compartments where R is removed or something like that, I'll, I'll label it removed. Uh, and you have to ask them online. And so these are not nearly recovered. They're, they're people who are no longer circulating in the population. And basically, this mapping, it turns out, is a homomorphism. It's not the only homomorphism, but it's an example of a homomorphism. So it's a structure preserving mapping that still honors this structure, but can coarse grain to make it rough, rougher categories, just like this one is kind of coarse grain. These distinctions on the left, we don't really distinguish them the way. Do you see that? Okay, let's let's uh, continue on this thread though. So these monotone maps um, for pre-orders are, are, are pretty intuitive, right? Um, almost so much so we don't, really start to think about, you know, is capital F of G after F the same as uh, F of G after F of F, um, lowercase f, you know, but it's the same play, they're, they're maps where things, just like Larissa said, things that are lower down, um, if one thing is below another on the left, it's below or it's no higher than that on the right. Do you see that? So this is a monotone map, right? Um, this is a monotone map. Um, uh, this is a monotone map. Um, uh, and you know whether it contains two, um, it basically, uh, if this contains two, then the thing above it definitely contains two. And so that's a monotone map, right? Um, uh, size greater than or equal to three, cardinality greater than or equal to three. That's a, another example of a monotone map. Um, and uh, I'm not going to show non monotone. Okay. Um, uh, you remember these schema categories, right? Um, here, to really make use of them, to, to kind of have them serve their function, we map them into what category? What category do we map schema categories into? Set, set. Sometimes we do into what's called fit set, where we, we don't really distinguish different sets as long as they're the same size or area. Skeleton fit set. But, but um, this is how we can encode stock flow diagrams, right? This is how we can encode country nets. This is how we can encode um, graphs. Um, and if we look at something like graphs, although this is a great use of functors, and it's one I'm really excited about. It's foundational to our work. Really, when we go up to large categories, each of those, each of those graphs is just a dot here, right? It's a graph. We don't have to worry that it's a functor secretly into sad or something like that. Don't worry about that. It's just it's just a dot. It's a graph. And these graph and these morphisms between the graphs. What are these? Graph homomorphisms. They're structure preserving maps between graphs, right? Um, and what are the flavor of those? Well, again, it's it it seems different on first glance, but it's it's just the rules of functors applied to this. It's just it's the same rules of functors. They just how they look at an intuitive level looks a little bit different. So we can map. You remember this, right? We did this. Remember, um, we we map a lowercase a over here to 
to uh, capital A uh, over on here, and we map the lowercase b and lowercase c to capital B. And uh, what we have over here on the left is uh, plan frame in kind of more detail than what we have on the right. But what we have on the right doesn't contradict what we have here. It's it's not like it flies in the face of it, that it scrambles what's here. No, no, no. It's just, it, it coarse grains it. It collapses it down in a consistent way. Are we comfortable with this? So this is a structure preserving mapping between graphs to be in this, in this amorphism from this to this, because this guy over here is, uh, is has a homomorphic relationship with this one to the right, right? Um, let me ask this. Is there uh, a morphism in the opposite way? Is this thing on the left uh, homomorphic to the thing on the right? The answer is... <laughs> no, no, it turns out it's, it's not. It, 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 it turns out that um, you can't have this nice mapping from B to multiple things here. Now, later we're going to see, we can get to what are called pro functors, and you can start to do some things like that. But you got to go pro. Um, <laughs> I mean, actually, um, uh, the, 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 there is some actually really interesting stuff we'll do with pro functors, the generalized functors, but we'll come to that. So dynamical systems, same basic idea, right? Like we can encode a given dynamical system with a functor and so on. But then we have this large category where dots are dynamical, discrete dynamical systems. And what are the morphisms between these? These are discrete dynamical system what? Homomorphisms. And they have kind of this flavor, right, where we collapse things down. Remember this? Remember we did this here when we said A, B, C, D all collapse to R here. It's like the rest, right? And a lowercase i goes to capital I, right? This is a dynamic, discrete dynamical system homomorphism. It's um, th there's a mapping from this to this. It's a structure honoring mapping. It's not the only structure honoring mapping. Like there could be other structure honoring mappings where maybe just these two are collapsed or something like that. There's going to be many structure preserving mappings of a given one of these to different targets. But again, this is like, when we talk about functors, this is what the face of a functor looks like when we're applying it to dynamical systems. You get that understanding? And we don't have to worry that dynamical systems secretly involve functors. No, no, that's not something we worry. Um, okay, so yes, uh, Tony. Um... Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, do you mean something like here? Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, so, okay. up, uh, yeah. Lowercase a, something like yeah. Map up, uh, yeah. Correct. Correct. And B, C, and D. Um, yes. All mapped into the identity morphism on, on uppercase R. Yeah. Is that kind of highly? No, no, it, it, it turns out it, that's a great question. It doesn't violate, it, it may seem at first glance, um, uh, you know, that it might risk violating, but it, it's it's a really good thing you're, you're thinking about that. I, I really like how you're thinking. Um, so here's the thing. Um, let's go back to the, to the rules of, of politics. Um, uh, so you recall these are the rules of, of what it means to do, right? Um, um, one thing that might be helpful is if I just say um, there's some famous citizens of the functor world, and one of them is actually the constant functor, okay? And this actually maps all objects in C to a single object. Uh, in D, and all morphisms in C. All these morphisms between objects in C are mapped to the identity morphism of the single object in D. That that actually is a functor. And maybe maybe we'll work to 
to see why a little bit. Um, here, where is it? Uh, here. So, um, first of all, let's let's consider whether it honors both of these things, right? It, it has to observe. It has to. It's a mapping of objects to objects, and morphisms up between those objects to corresponding morphisms between the maps. You know, the mappings of those objects, right? Um, so a morphism A to B here is mapped to something going between F of A and F of B, right? Um, but here are the conditions, right? Um, so an identity morphism in, in a source object is mapped to the identity on the target. So imagine if you have A and it's mapped onto capital R, remember that? Um, and you have B here also mapped onto capital R um, and C also mapped onto to capital R. Um, but we can still have this hope, right? That that uh, the, the mapping of the identity is the identity of the result. Okay, now let's look at composition of morphisms. Okay, so in um, the original category, um, uh, we, we need to be able to compose any two things, map that over and get the same result as mapping over and then compose. So let's let's go look at that category that that um, you're or look at that case that you're concerned about here. Right. So here, um, okay, we have, we have to be a little bit careful here because first of all. Um, a, a key thing is that I realized you, you may be thinking about that's actually not, not just on appliance. Is this a category here? Is, is this a, is what being shown a category? Let, let me ask this, is this a category here? It's a graph. This is, this is actually a graph, it's not a category. Is this a category? No, it's it's not itself a depiction of a category. Um, it's encoded. Uh, it can be encoded by mapping from this category into some set, but it's not itself like this is. It's not like this as an identity morphism. It's just a graph. Um, it's not like this as an identity morphism. It's just a graph. It's not like this is. I know this looks like. Uh, a Hasse diagram, it looks like a, a category, but this is actually just a visual depiction of what this is uh, encoding here. And and so the, the real question, Tony, is, um, is so, so there is a mapping, an underlying mapping from this uh, func the functor that encodes this. So this is encoded by a functor. It's a functor from what? What is this encoded by? This is a functor, this graph, or sorry, this DDS. Um, well, okay, I'll start with this one. This is encoded by a functor. What's, what's that functor from? Like this graph is encoded by a functor from what to what? graph to, to set, right? This one is also encoded by a functor from what? Graph to set. Is it the same functor that encodes both? No, it's different functors, right? But, but there is a mapping between those functors, it turns out, okay? Um, that is structure preserving that is natural, okay? Um, that collapses things down in a consistent way. Um, and that is called, and we're gonna get to it, a natural transformation, okay? It's a mapping between functors from the same source to the same target, but they're different functors. Um, and it turns out that mapping is natural. And we're gonna see that it honored structure later, but don't get caught up in thinking that these are categories. These are just 
depictions of, so these are graphs that depict the, you know, what is uh, encoded by something like this. This is depicting, drawing a nice picture of what's encoded here. It's not like this is a category itself. Does that help? Yeah, okay. Um, okay, uh, so great question and I hope that's helpful, but one thing you're maybe starting to get a flavor of is when I say there are these structure preserving mappings between functors that are called natural transformations, that will be a key next step. It's bringing us up, as Eugenia Chung said, uh, Chang said, uh, another level in our thinking. Okay, so we're going to have another dimension, which is mapping between functors. And, and that starts to sound stretchy, but it's very useful and it comes out in that in this year. This year mapping, no, not that you were asking about. This mapping is is a natural transformation. It's mapping from one point to another. Okay, but it's a structure preserving mapping that honors that structure in the same kind of flavor that we're talking about for categories. And it honors it honors the structure of the of the of the functors. Um, you could either do one first and then do. Um, either sort of uh, uh, apply the first functor and map over or um, and, and perform a, a morphism or uh, do the morphism first and as lifted by the other functor. And, and um, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll explain to you next round. Um, okay, so one thing I gave you though for the exercise was thinking about functors. It's, it's another, um, it's another facet of, of functors that turns out to be really useful, really common, and absolutely essential in a couple of places. Okay. Um, and, and, and particularly one that I want to highlight. Uh, so it's this notion of, of functors as applied to shape categories. Okay. Um, we we often use categories to encode a certain shape. And I'm not talking about like schemas. Schemas, you know, allowing us to encode through mapping the set or a different matter. You, you might say, well, they're kind of shaped like, well, yeah, but I'm, I'm talking about something more basic than that. I'm talking about um, these kind of quintessential shapes. Um, and they're so important when we give them names. So is a category one, which just as a single object, single stinking, well, it's not stinking, it's beautiful object. It's a beautiful object, okay? Um, there's another one called two or walking pair. It's like the essence of pairhood. The first is like the essence of objecthood. There's a category arrow and a category isomorphism, okay? Um, now, let's look at this walking object category. So this category one, this is called one. This category is called one. Mm -hmm. And there's a single object. Category theorists, I think, often like to call it star. It's the only thing, why do we have to name it? It's just what it is. Um, and, and there's just one identity morphism. So I want to ask, what is, if we map this into, and I'm going to use this category on the right um, here. Uh, uh, I, I, I picked this without privilege, and I, I just I, I was looking for an arbitrary category in the right. And I'm on a category which had arrows in multiple directions, and some objects that had arrows between one both directions, and some that had multiple self arrows, and then this seemed seemed worthwhile. Um, okay, so what I want to ask is, if you were to map from this category in the left. Uh, this this category, the walking object. And I want to map it to the right. How many different way, how many different functors are there that would map it from on the left to the right? How many different fun distinct functors are there mapping from this, from the left uh, to the category of the right? Three. 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 The answer is three. 
The answer is three. What are those three categories? Or oh, sorry, what are those three functions? What are those three? Functions? Yes, the reason. A, B, Exactly. Yeah. Um, now, when you say mapping A to A and, and A to B or A to C, and I apologize for the using those same names. Um, well, how about the morphism? What, remember, functors, maybe even more critically, map, how they map objects, yeah, it's kind of worthwhile. How they map morphisms is actually much more, often much more interesting. But in this case, what is this? Identity morphism have to map to whatever the corresponding identity morphism is. So we don't really have a bunch of choice, right? It's not like you could say, oh, for B, I want it to map to the outermost loop or something. No, you can't do that. Have to map to what? To the identity on the right. Yeah. So, so three. Okay. So let me ask this. Um, if if we had uh, seven objects on the right there in the C, if you can imagine in any which way, how many how many uh, functions would there be? So, so we had a hundred on the right. How many would there be? A hundred. So here's the thing: the mapping from this on the left to the right it counts the number of what? Objects. objects counts the number of objects. Now, now this is quite important because it allows us to start to talk about the size of a collection of stuff, like stuff with order, or these could be a discrete category like set where we don't have any morphisms between them. All we have is identities. allows us to sort of count the number of elements of that, right? If this thing on the right were a hundred elements of, and forgive me, I'm just gonna go brutally back here, but um, if it looked like, uh, okay, okay, it went the wrong, went the wrong way, sorry. Um, if it looked like this, and you had the mapping from that category one, that so-called walking object comes this thing on the right, how many would it count? How many more, how many functors would there be from the walking objects, this thing on the right to a category? This is a discrete, that's it. Uh, sorry. Yeah. I'm actually in this word discrete category, each of these is an object with a with a uh, identity morphism. How many functors would there be? Three. Three. Yeah. It counts. So if you're mapping into uh, a category which is a discrete category, um from a category which is this one. This category of, of of the walking object, uh, all it does is is count the number of of uh, objects in that category. This is really important because it lets us talk about the size of something, count the number of things without referring to each element. It, it's just we can enumerate all the functors into it. The count of morphisms into it. If it's if we have a category where each of these are categories and there's morphisms and there's a function. Okay. And by the way, that's where we're going to be going to the lot. We have categories here. Eugenia Chang mentions it in chapter 13. This is called CAC. And these of these morphisms within CAT, if each of these objects is a category, what are the morphisms? Between categories, what are structure preserving mappings between categories? They are functors. These are functors here, and the number of functors from the category one, the walking object category, to uh, each other category tells us what number of objects, right? Um, Remember that reminds you of a certain exercise we did where you kind of deduce like the size of the set. So in that, the number of morphisms from the category one into these things tells you the number of objects. By the way, this may remind you, do you remember in set? What was that neat 
object in set, that neat set where if we looked at how many things that had into any other set, um, maybe this is the set with three things in it. What was the one here that corresponded to that? What, what set would have a number of functions into another set equal to the number of elements of that other set? The set of one of set with one of them. Yeah. The null set, it, it's a really good thing to think about that, Tony, but the null set was special in another way. The set with a single thing, well, it could map to the first, or it could map to the second, or it could map to the third. What is it that the null set would map to, but the, the empty set? What, what would that map to? It, it has a really nice property. Tony's exactly right as the source of it. It has a, just a single error to any other uh, to any other set. It, it, like, to, to this set, it would have a single error because it has no choices to make, right? This, the null set, it just, it's gone. It doesn't, it, it's not like you could choose which one it goes to. It's just, it's gone and it's nothing to specify. So it has kind of this absurd arrow to any one. Whereas the singleton object, the singleton set can have an equal number of functions. If this reminds you a little bit of that in CAD, it's for a good reason. Um, one acts like the singleton set in CAD. Okay, in, in terms of, it's the, here it's the, the, the terminal object in, in, in set, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll explore that likely at a later point. Okay, so this is the walking object. It allows us to count the number of objects in any category, which is kind of cool if we consider count or count. How about this one? Um, oops, sorry. How about this one? Uh oh, 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 I thought there was walking. Oh, walking pair. What does walking pair get? How many morphisms are from walking pair to this thing on the right? Okay. Um, so I like what you're thinking. Exactly. Um, so each of these objects, A and B, could map to what? Uh, any of these, right? So we could have, and again, forgive the, the same. A, a could map to a, so A and B could both map to A. A and B could uh, map, so A could map to A, B could map to B, you know, and, and basically any A could map to any of the three, and B could map to any of the three. So it's, it's two, One. I'm sorry, it's yeah. It's three to the uh, oh, oh man. Oh, what am I doing? Uh, so it's from two, it's it's three squared, right? So a, the A can map to any of the three, B can map to any of the three. So we have the three times three. Um, right? Um uh and and again it's three squared, and the way in which I, I think of it is kind of it's a mapping down from from uh, I think of size two into a, a thing of size three. And it turns out this is going to be an important information later. But do you see that this fundamentally though, each of those more each of those functors into C encodes a choice of two objects. Do you see that? If we pick one object for A over here on the left and one object for B, right? And Tony's exactly right. You have this, this, um, each one can pick in an unrestricted way from the right, right? Each one can pick A to pick any of these three, A, B, or C over on the right. B can pick any of these three, right? Is, is it a problem if A and B go to the same one for a problem? No, it's not a problem at all for, the, for this one, right? Um, uh, do the identity morphisms give us any choice? Any, do we have to make any choices with them? No. Are we okay with that, Tony? Okay. So so let's let's ramp up a little bit. Um, so that was walking object, walking pair. How about walking arrows? Okay, so 
How many things can this map to on the right? Well, let's let's think about it. Can you give me one that it could map to on the right that's particularly simple? Like the, like it's so simple, it's just it's almost pathetic. It's just like it's it's like oh no, it, it just did like the crudest thing, yes, Eric. A, B, and the left both map to A on the right, and then all of the morphisms are A, Z, and Good. Or same with B. Okay. Now, notice that is possible. It's not contradictory. What does F map into? Eric, you said it. I mean, I didn't. That's okay. That's okay. Because A got morphed into, you know, and A over there, B got sucked into the hegemony, right? And and they they got absorbed into and, and F turns into an identity. Um uh it's going from what is F going from on over on the left? It's going from what to what on the left? A to B. A to B. And what is it going to go to over on the right with the error? A to A. A to A. A. That's fine, right? Yeah. It, it can go with the, the identity. That's okay. Remember, these are just dots. These are just uh, dots there. We don't have to worry what's inside them. And so we could go to the identity morphism. Yeah, it's okay. Um, okay, let me let me ask this. What's what's one? So could that generalize to any of the objects? It could map uh, to B in the same way, map into C in the same way, right? Okay, that's something it could do. Now give me one that's like more more interesting. What could A map to in, in a case where A and B map to different objects, but ones that are that are you know nice and okay. What could a map to so the structure preserving honor the structure, honor the ability to go from A to B with that. Um, a map to A map to C, B map to D. Okay, remember, so, so good, but remember an object on the left can only map to one thing. Oh. Remember, objects have to map to a specific thing. It's a it's a function on objects. It says, so a, a functor specifies for any object in the source what particular single object it maps to in the target. It's a function on objects. By the way, co-functors will buy like that later. Uh, but but in case you know, yeah. a graph that is possible. Sorry? If uh, the one on the right is a graph, then it's possible. If, it, if it's a graph, if it's a what? A graph. A graph. Then I put oh. oh, oh, you're saying if you mean if it's like the graph schema? Is that what you mean? Or, or no? Uh, because I'm still confused about the idea of how we can collapse the game one. Oh, oh, okay. The graph on the morphism. Yeah. Okay. Here we're not doing a graph homomorphism. We're we're just um so the graph. I mean, you can have A and B map to the same thing, right? We said that earlier. That's kind of a collapsing down, right? They both map down, but if a can only map to one thing and B can only map to one thing. They could be to the same thing, but could you mention something A maps to that's different from B, but still honors the structure? Still this structure is, is honored in that you can still get from A to B in a morphism that corresponds to F. Yes, Marisa. Maps to C, uh, maps to the arrow to uh, A from C, and then B maps to A. And B maps to A, yeah. So that, so that would be right. So here, as Larissa is saying, A maps to C, B maps to A, and F maps to this guy here. Do you get, do you get that? Are you comfortable with that? Do you see why this honors this, right? That, that we have... Um, this, uh, you know, F is now between these two. It's not honoring in quite the sense that we said honoring composition or, or identity morphism before, but, but, you know, F needs to go from where F mapped to, which is C, 
to where B map to, which is A. Do you get that? Okay, so I want to ask this though. What what would be a mapping from of, of A and B that wouldn't be okay? What what one would would cause problems? Yes, Larissa. A mapping to A and B mapping to C. Okay, yeah. So if A map to A and B to C, what's the problem? Um, yeah. Right. You can't go, you can't map F to this guy here, it's the light blue, because it's going the wrong way, right? So that would be a problem. We we can't do it, right? So what are if we think about these functors, what are they like what are they? We said earlier that for the walking, the walking object, that first one, one. That was kind of picking out the, the objects over here. We said that mapping from two, the walking pair, was kind of picking out pairs of objects. What is this picking out? What is, like, what do we think of it as kind of selecting or identifying these various functors? What are they highlighting for us? What are they, what, what, what are they matching? They're matching what different things in this one to the right? Arrows. Arrows, arrows in a certain direction uh, between pairs of objects, right? There's one of these for every arrow from one object to the next. Are, are we okay with that? But I want to sharpen that a little bit, but yeah. Uh, can we map F to a composite arrow? Like for example, if we say A and B both map to A and F maps to one of the arrows from A and B composed with the one from Okay. okay, so say this say this again. So if you you're gonna map A and B on the left over to what? A to A. And then F maps to the composition of one of those arrows from A to B composed with that single arrow from B back to A. Uh, uh okay. I think what you're saying is could you map F now um onto uh so th so this is very, very nice, sir. Um, uh, so if we think of this as a free category on the on the right, where any path is a new morphism, that's what a free free category would be. Um, there is a morphism that Eric is identifying. It's, it's beautiful. Um, there's gonna be one morphism that goes in the dark blue here. I'll, I'll trace it on the, the screen here. Um, this dark blue over here and then back. And that's a morphism from where to where. If we compose this guy after this upper blue one, where's that morphism? What's its domain and codomain? What is it going from and what is it going to? A, a, a back to A. And is there a different one for this guy here? And the answer is yes, there's a, there's a different one. We just don't draw it because it's implied by this, um, but uh, by the composition, if we say it's the free category, really this should say the free category sort of induced by this. It's, it's my bad, I should have said that because that means any path that's implied by these will also be part of the category. So there is one like that. And you're saying, could F go to that? It certainly could. It certainly could. Could ID of A go to that? No, because identities have to go to what? Identities. Um, ID of B has to go to this if it's mapped both onto A. But F could go, could map to this one or it could map to this one here, right? Yeah. Um, and in fact, Eric, um, there's going to be many of you go to because there's this path, like around this one, and then there's doing it twice. If it's a free category, doing it twice is in general different than doing it once. And it's basically um, as many, each, each new path is going to be different. And, and the notion of path means that you're, you're honoring associativity. So if it's 
you know, you don't count it as different if it's A, B, and then C compared to A and then B and C. It's 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 the same path, A, B, C. Um, so yeah, this F actually is a lot of a lot of freedom. Um, so so we're picking out here um, arrows and or pick out morphisms, right? Um, uh, from an object to itself, as well as between objects with this arrow. So this arrow is kind of enumerating for us or, or, or identifying for us, selecting for us these morphisms in the target category. Do you get that? Are you comfortable with that? That it's sort of finding these things, locating them, highlighting them for us? In other words, there's a functor for each one of these, and, and there won't be functors for ones that fly a foul where like F cannot possibly map onto this and F can't map on going this way either. So there's going to be a, a functor for every pair of, of objects where there's a morphism from the first object to the second object. Like that. Are we okay with that? Okay. Um, how about how about this guy walking isomorphism? Uh, um, what what's that gonna? What is that going to identify? Um, so here we have two objects, C and D, and could they map? Um, uh, could could C on the left map to C on the right and D on the left map to D on the right? Sorry? Oh, sorry. So, uh, D on the left map to C on the right? So, so this guy, oh, sorry. Um, did this one up here? Could it map there? So yeah, could you? Is it possible that C here could map to C there and D here could map to C here? Yes. What would F and G have to be? Identity on C. Identity on C. They'd have to be identity on C. If, if C on the left and D on the right map to A over here on the right, so sorry, C and D on the left, each map to A on the right, um, what could F and G be? Sorry? Uh, so they could be identity on A. Yeah, they, they could be identity on A. Do we have choice in the map, though, for Eric's comment? Yeah, you could be the composed arrow. Right? Yeah, you could be these composed. If this is a free category, then any paths of these are different. And so there's going to be a lot from A to A, and and F and G can be those. But let's suppose we weren't looking, and, and sort of a similar thing with this guy over here, except now we have all these green ones, right? Um, okay. Now, let's suppose though that C map to A on the right and G map to, to B on the right. What could F be and what could G be? Hmm? What could F be? Can you give me one thing that could be? Either one of the blue arrows. Either one of the blue arrows. What could G be? Only well, that one arrow. Only that one, right? Could and it could be those composed ones. No, uh, well, I uh, um so these two can't be composed because they're not end to end, right? But you could go um from uh, yeah you, you could go uh, okay these two are, are coming out but you could go this way around um but that's the same as kind of going up here uh and around um yeah my brain is going to go up. Oh yeah, up there. Yeah. Um, let me ask this. Could could C map to A and D map to C? 
Why not? What what what's the problem? Arrows point in the wrong direction. Yeah. So so if C map to A and D map to C, it works okay for G, right? Because there's a arrow down this way, but it doesn't work for F, so we can't do that. So it can't map that match that pattern. So what this is picking out is kind of isomorphisms here, or, or um, uh, yeah, these these sort of um, patterns of loops, which are canceling to yield the um, to yield identities uh, over here. Uh, and so here on the left, there's none other than these uh, self loops. So F and G have to compose the identity. And and uh, that is something which you know we can spot here by mapping these things onto here. Uh, we can spot isomorphic relationships here that um, that will compose uh, onto. And I believe it's it's identifying isomorphism. I'll come back to this in a in a minute. Okay. Um. I wanna I wanna though ask about a different challenge, which is functors to this shape category. So imagine now we have this thing over on the left, this category C, and we have walking object on right. What is the collection of functors from C to this look like? <laughs> But yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it turns out that's a constant functor. It just it just like gloms it all into A, and all the morphisms over on the left go to what? Identity. identity. And it's all got to identity. Um, uh, gloms it all together. Came across this in the exercise in my head. I was referring to it as the black hole functor. It's yeah. sort of. Collapse. It just collapses it, uh, just squeeze it all. That's right. Um, uh, how about this one? So mapping, so functors mapping things in the left into into uh, this uh, this here. What? How can we map things in the left into this pair of objects with no morphisms between them on the right? Where could all the things in the left go? What's one place they could all go? All the way. Okay. What's another place they could all go? B. Okay. Could half of them go to A and half to B? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. So where would these morphisms go? There's no morphism to map onto. Uh, if we had an F between this, it would be a different matter, but we have none. Here, so basically, this leads them to either all be here or all be here. It's like pick, right? It's like pick one or the other. Except if this has no morphisms between, in which case you can you can be more a little bit more free. But but otherwise, you have to pick. They all go down into here. They all it's like pick your black hole, right? Um, how about this one? This one's kind of interesting. What? What is this map to over on the right? Okay. Okay. So so let's 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 dig into this a little bit more. Give me something. Could everything still map to uh, A on the right? Is that is a would it be okay with a functor everything map to A on the right? Is that okay? Yeah. Everything map to B on the right. Is that okay? Yeah, that's kind of boring, but yeah. Um, okay, now let's think could um could C map to A and could A and B both map to B over on the right? So C maps to A. So so that's that's this one map to this one. And A and B uh, map to this guy. Um, and what would what would the light blue map to? Uh, F. What would the black map to? Uh, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. 
Okay, but let's, can you tell me one that's not okay? Well, you don't want it. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so uh, I think you're getting the point. Yeah. So tell me the problem that comes up with uh, with the others, Tony. Uh, it has to do with the direction. Yeah, you have to do with the direction, right? Because if if A and B on the left are not mapped to the same thing over here on the right, what happens? There's no arrow going the other way, right? C and A both map to A on the right, and then B maps to B on the right. Uh, so C and A map to A on the right? Yeah, and then B is to B. And B is to B. Yeah, but there's still this guy oh, right, here. Right, right, right. So it, it can't. Yeah, you got a great, great, great idea, but um, killed by an ugly fat. Um, uh, okay, so, so what would, so, so, so let me ask what, what is this kind of doing? Um, what is, what is this kind of picking out or, or what, what, what structure is it kind of imposing on the right, on the left hand side here? What is it? What is it opposing? Or what is it? Yeah. What is it? What is it allowing? Things that what? Things that kind of. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to express it nicely. But it's kind of things that map match this that are consistent with this one-way structure that flow in that sort of way from. Can we say that E has to be a terminal object in the original category? Uh, so that E on the right has to be a terminal object on the left side. Uh, so B here, um, like I, I wouldn't say B on, uh, so you could have A and B on the left, both map to B on the right. On the right category, uh, even though they're not terminal here. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but what this does do is have it kind of it divides the objects in the category up such that there is flow from one set to the other set consistent with that single. There's one way flow, right? It's it's like you, it allows you to separate the the category into almost components where one set is upstream of another set. So like C is upstream of A and B here. And so C can be on the C on the left category can map to A on the right category. And A and B on the left category can map to B on the right category. And because C in left category is upstream of the audience, right? It can all things coming from A can be mapped to F. Um, now, of course, the, they can be mapped trivially to A, all to A on the right category, or all to B. But if you're going to divide them up, it has to divide up in kind of upstream downstream, right? Do do you see that? Where it has to be that way because F. F is there. How about, how about this one? Is there more freedom here or less freedom? And how we map it on the left? Less freedom. What's that? Okay. So, okay, that's, that's, that's interesting. Um, so I would say my, my own first glance at this would be, or you know, thinking about this, I would think, okay, adding G's here um, gives us more freedom because the things on the left don't have to be upstream of the things on the right. Like we could divide up, could A be in, could A and C here now go on to C on the right, the left-hand side on the 
Could, could they go to this one? A and C in the left, on the left category. Oh, um, go to here. And then B, go over here. Yeah, you can because these two blue arrows here could map to F. And this red arrow could map to G. Uh, and of course, the identities map to identities. Um, uh, now, uh, it is true that, Eric, those path composites that are here and these guys here would have to map onto these identities, right? But we could do it. We have more freedom as to what goes in here, what goes in here, I think. It's because you can, it's not restricted upstream. Okay. So, so the general rules here, I tried to sort of co codify them. Um, if you if you have shape into a category, those are the first ones we looked at, where it's like you're finding the arrow in the downstream category. Like watch uh, object picks out objects. Hmm? It identifies each object. There's a more there's a functor from the shape category to this other category. So from the walking object to this other category for each object, right? And then each one of those kind of picks up a specific object in the target. For walking pair, picks up pairs, regardless of whether or not they're connected, right? It doesn't care about connectivity, it just pairs it. Walking arrow, what does it do? It picks arrows out from category C, we said that earlier. Walking isomorphism picks isomorphism out from C. Um, uh, a set with two objects. Well, okay, we didn't really talk about this one. Um, but uh, the other direction, where like you're going from category C to these shapes, it's like walking objects. This says existence. I, I don't know. I, I compiled this from some stuff from David Spivak and Brendan Fong, I think, um, at the MIT course uh, in 2021. Um, excuse me, 2020. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll, this is the black hole point, right? It says existence, but it just all goes to one point. And all the morphisms go to right there. Walking pair, this kind of separates all objects into two groups. And again, it says with a stiff restriction that any two objects that exhibit a morphism between those have to go in the same object. Why do they have to go in the same object? Like, uh, why why can't they go into different objects here? If, if there's a morphism between them. Remember that? Yeah, if there's no morphism on the right. There's no morphism mapped. But if, if there are objects over here on the left that weren't connected, there was a discrete, there's sort of discrete object, could it map to either one? Yeah, it's no restriction there, right? Um, uh, so it's sort of classifies the, them um, uh, in the sense that any that are connected in the same connected component in the category, the same network of connections in the category, you can get from one to the other, they have to go in the same one, right? They can't go in different ones. It's like the connected components, things that are connected together in the, in the category have to go to the same object in the in the in this either A and and B here, right? Do you get that? Are we okay with that? Okay. Um this okay, this flow thing. I I I kind of like it as kind of upstream, downstream. I think um David Spivak from Brett and Kong said one is kind of sources and one is things, or maybe that was part of the use But um here uh as it says, classify the objects of C into two groups. It's a little bit like the previous one, but with the restriction that any two objects where there's a morphism from X to Y, so any two objects X to Y where there's a morphism from X to Y um, uh, must either be mapped to A or both mapped to B. Um, so either both mapped to A, both mapped to B, in which case they're fine, they're black hole sort of thing. Or X to A and Y to B, right? So, so they have to be in there. They have to be classified upstream downstream. Are we okay with that? Um, that idea. Um, so we split like the category C into two pieces, such so, so that all arrows 
upstream downstream uh, go between them is is one way to to represent it. Either that is kind of just put it to entirely into one or entirely into the other. Um, uh, isomorphism it, it sort of um, here it separates objects into two sets with no restrictions and to what is in what set because you have the freedom of these morphisms between them. You can put them in one, put them in the other. There can be morphisms in either order. Um, and then there's a, a final one too, which we didn't cover. Um, so uh, what I, I know this may seem a little bit arbitrary, but it turns out that this whole idea of like mapping, thinking about these maps, these functors from one category, a particularly simple category, particularly one into, into um, another category, it turns out to be important and knowing that it like counts objects. Just like here, remember with sets, the singleton set counted the elements of the target. The, the functions of the singleton set count the elements in the target. Do you get that? Okay. Um, any questions about this? Uh, we're, we've got to um, wrap up here in just a second. I, I just want to highlight a, a few other small things. Any questions about this? Are we okay with this? Okay, um, so the final thing I wanna leave you with is something we may return to in a little bit more detail at another time. And that's this category task, okay? Um, and I'm gonna go light on this sort of pseudo cast, uh, this so-called quasi category, okay? Um, and, um, I'll just note that when we're dealing with this category, we have the objects are tons, flows, doubles, ends, for example, um, or lists of ghouls, or lists of flows, or lists of doubles, or, or pairs of double and integers. These are the types. The, the arrows are functions between. Um, okay, these are these are um, functions from one type to another. So, for example, it might be from double into bool that would say whether or not it's greater than zero, or something like that. Um, or you know, is negative from a floater into a bool there. Um, now, uh, an important thing to recognize here, and uh, is that. And, and again, this is just going to be a taste of it for now. Uh, I think we could have you know, even a couple sections on this. Um, functors in this area are things like, so what is the job of a functor? Well, it's going to be an endo functor. What are you by endo functors? Anyone remember? I used that term before, but uh, what is it? When I say an endo functor for category has, what is that? Oh, pass that ask. Yeah. So if I say the list functor in Hask, what do you think? So it's going to map each each object. Just remember type, right? Like double. What do you think it's going to map double to? The list functor. List of doubles. List of doubles. What do you think it'll map bool to? List of bulls. And that's it turns out a, a functor. Okay, so it'll it'll map doubles to list of doubles, it'll map bulls to list of bulls, ints to list of ints. That's that's what list does. It's type parameterized, it takes a type and give you a say a list, it'll it'll um you could say a list of doubles in in has Okay. Um, now, again, I, I, I have said that what a functor does on objects is what students coming to this often fixate on. But the more, much more interesting is what does it do on morphisms? So suppose you have a morphism that is negative that goes from a float to a pool. So for any float, it will give you a pool. 
and I apply, remember, a functored list, object, or it maps objects to objects, and it maps morphisms to what? That's a function to do. It maps morphisms in the source category to morphisms in the what? target category. What's the target category here of the list function? Passing. Passed again. So the list functor maps float to a list of float and maps bool to a list of bool. What blood map is negative to? A map operation, of a map operation that applies. So, so is negative when hit by list will now not just take a float and return a bool as what is negative did originally. List applied, the functor applied to is negative will give you, will lift it to be something which takes list of floats to, guess what? List of bools. And what do you think it does? So if, if I give you a function that takes a, a given flow and it returns a bool, it'll just say, is it negative? Suppose well, I give you a function. What do you think list will do to that? If, if the job of list applied to that is to take in a list of floats and give you back a list of bools, how do you think that would work? For each element in the list of floats, it's gonna give a bool. And so one by one, the first flow to classify is it negative? And yes or no. And the second, you know, true or false. And the next one, true or false. And the next one, true or false. Next one. So do you see how lifting is negative can give you a map from list of flow to list of bool? Do you see that? Um, same thing with is even. So if I give you an is even function that goes from that says for a given in whether or not it's even. And I hit it with a list functor, it will now be lifted into a function that does what? It takes in a, if I hit it with a list functor, it becomes, I lift it with the list functor, it becomes a function that, that takes in a what? A list of ints and returns a list of bools by simply applying the original function to each element. So that's how it lifts, lifts these morphisms, okay? Um, now, that's where the, the list functor, um, it's not the, the only functor. For example, maybe functor also operates differently. And, and what maybe would do is the maybe functor will take in, and, and if you give it this even, what it will do is, so the maybe functor would map int to what? Maybe event. So it would, the, the object, int, be mapped to maybe event, right? The type, int will be mapped to maybe event, bool will be mapped to what? Maybe a bool. And so now, if we hit is even with, the, if we lift is even with the maybe functor, it's gonna take in a maybe event, something that may or may not include an int, right? It's either int or it's nothing. And guess what it's going to do? What's the function of that? What's the what's that lifted function going to do? That function that operates on maybe to give you a maybe a bool. Uh, it'll do is even if it is an int, and it'll give you nothing if it has nothing. Exactly. Exactly. That's the equivalent. That's the lifting of is even to operate on maybe. And it's going to be very similar for all these others. It could be either, it could be pair, or it could be, you know, a tree or, or other types of monads. Um, uh, it's going to, lifting it with a morphism is going to let it operate on these maps of those things. So it's going to, uh, when we hit it with the functor, uh, it will go from, like list events to list of bools, or maybe events to maybe of bools, but it automatically knows how to lift this. Uh, it, it knows how to lift the, the morphism. Now, when we specify the functor, when we um, give the rules for it, we will specify how to lift for this. And 
and uh, it, it's called uh, specifying the F. And the F value will specify F and F. So here we're saying, given a function from A to B, um, I'm going to tell you how to give a function from maybe A to maybe B. And what I'm going to do is, if what you give me is nothing, at the maybe at the end say, um, I'm going to give you nothing back. And otherwise, I am going to apply this function to to the uh, uh, to this value and give you just that value back. Okay. Um, so that's f of applied to x here. So if you give me a value just just three, um, I will give you back just uh, the function is even applied to three, and and it's going to say no, oh, you know, false. So it'll be just a false. Okay. This is a bit of Haskell code. I that's all I wanted to cover on this right now, just to introduce this idea into your mind. But functors are absolutely central features of the functional programming world. And we're going to be exploring them some more in later lectures. But I just, I just want you to know that they have these programming analogs in, in um, functional languages that are really powerful. Okay? And so functors are a fundamental building block in the functional programming world. And they're incredibly powerful, and they correspond directly to they are functors, um, as long as we accept that this quasi category past we treat as a, uh, as a as a category. The big the fly in the ointment. In case you're wondering why isn't this a real category, the big fly in the ointment is non-termination. We can have things that like hang they, they never complete and so they don't return anything it's a function from you know a to b but it never returns it just hangs okay that's all we have time for today thank you very much and uh i will i've given you uh, some more little pattern exercises but i'd like you to uh read chapter 14 for next time if that's good okay okay great Hopefully this is as fun for you as it is for me. I really enjoyed it.